All right. Uh, I guess welcome to, geez, for U.S. history. Um, I think this is part three of our uh, lecture series on <clears throat> a house divided. Just want to give you a heads up the soup is excellent. And if you didn't pre order, they have some extra, you can uh, go down and get some. So get a bowl of soup. Uh, that doesn't apply to you. Uh, I'm, in fact, I don't think they went down to the school, probably, period. Uh, but there is a vendor here who has some soup for teachers. So there you go, uh, for your information. All right, so in this section on a house divided, and uh, we're now in the digital copy of the notes I sent you. Uh, we've gotten through part one. We're now in part two of a house divided. And uh, I think in our lecture series, this is part three. So uh, before we get into that, some housekeeping. Uh, I hope I talked about this to the World Civ classes. Uh, you know, last Wednesday was the due date for this song assignment. There were a couple stragglers into Thursday of people who forgot or, or what have you. And um, I'm gonna make sure I'm not forgetting stuff. But there's probably you know, and for the most part, like two thirds of you turned it in. Uh, that was a good indicator, and I like that. Uh, there's still about like a fifth of the class probably who hasn't turned it in, and um, you know, I keep reminding you, please don't take advantage of the situation in a poor way, in the sense of, we want you to take advantage of it in a good way, but not in a bad way, in the sense that, uh, as I have sent that initial email out to parents and student emails through the Swift Reach program, I sincerely hope that, you know, you are uh, uh, diligent in looking at that email and that you, uh, if you have friends and stuff in the class and they're totally out of the loop by choice. I think that's honestly at this point, it's by choice and not out of like actual work and trying to stay up to date. Please remind them, say, hey, don't forget, Mr. Pierce got the modules that are uploaded on YouTube. Um, make sure you follow along with the guided notes. Make sure you're getting ready for the test on the 31st. Uh, help remind them of that too. I, I do worry. I've had a couple straggler emails and I'm, I'm a little suspicious, a little skeptical, like, no, you know what's going on. Like, you know no self-respecting teacher would have nothing going on, period. Uh, this intent going through YouTube has been mainly to help students feel like there's a little bit more of a personal connection. Uh, I had some feedback from students that the Canvas outlook is just, it's very bleak in that you know things are posted on there and they're set there to sit for two weeks at a time and it's very self-directed. I don't want that to be the case. I'm trying to get a little bit more personal engagement with students going through both email uh, individual feedback that way and uh, through YouTube just to hopefully make your lives a little more engaged during this weird time but I hope students don't take advantage of that in a bad way and saying well I didn't know it was there like please follow through with your school emails and uh, parent emails uh, for this US history class but like I said by and large most everybody's good there's a couple people who might be feigning ignorance and I'm like nah you know what's going on um, so make sure you follow up with that especially on the song assignment I, at this point, people turning it in late, I, I'll give you some credit. I'll be lenient that way, I don't do late work usually, but I'll give you some credit. Uh, so better late than never in that case. Uh, in terms of feedback on the assignment, um, there were a, a lot of well-written papers. There were several of them that really stuck out. Um, I liked uh, Ty's paper, Deference to the Military. It was a, a well-written one, and I appreciated that. But in terms of getting the, the 30 out of 30, what you needed to do, some students forgot their, some kids got like a 25 out of 30 or a 20 out of 30 because they did the first part on their song. They explain uh, in detail why it is that their song motivates them or inspires them. But then when we shifted down to the Star Spangled Banner, um, some students said, yeah, it's a really good song that people get patriotic on. That's a very circular definition. That doesn't tell me why is it that people are motivated or inspired? Think historically. Go back to the advent of it, Francis Scott Key and what happened in the War of 1812 and 1814, the Battle of Baltimore, where was he? He was on a ship. You know, those are the things that you need to talk about in detail for you to get the 30 out of 30. And some people just didn't. They just got too general in that second part. So that's what dinged some kids in getting a 25 or a 20 out of 30 is they were just saying, people should stand or shouldn't stand, it's up to them. And that's true, but the question was, is what has made that inspirational for the country? And that is the history of it, historically, and using the notes that we talked about. So um, uh, that's what we needed to get for the full credit. 
Uh, to get the extra credit, the five points that are added on, um, some students added a YouTube link or Spotify link, and that, that's all good. I loved it. Uh, I had a good time getting to know more of you that way. Some of you, it's been interesting. Some have felt, um, even during the normal like day-to-day -day school, a little more um, reticent to, to let themselves out there. And I, I love that honesty. And so some of their songs reminded them to like put themselves out there. And it's so funny. We all think in the time that we're face to face in class that we are our own islands. But man, that's not the case. It's so funny, even as a 36 year old guy having gone through high school and all those weird things too, we always think we are, but we really aren't. And I appreciated people's honesty. And I hope that those individuals who did share that could look at some of my feedback and say, all right, you know, Mr. Pure, you're right. Like I'm going to be a little more communicative, a little more open once school gets back in session, and even now in, in any ways possible. Uh, so, so that's some of the good feedback I saw there. Um, uh, I liked some of the classical pieces that were there. Uh, I, I just enjoyed getting to know more about you. Uh, there are some certain people who their background just really was compelling, and um, whether through health issues or family issues, and I, I really appreciated that. And I encourage you to continually, because remember, one of our big goals in this class is to talk about contract integrity of leaders with people and how you work interpersonally with one another, that you take this example from the song assignment and still keep applying it to other parts in U.S. history. That was sort of like a fun little hoppy rabbit through that video. Um, so that's a, that's a point that I hope you, you do take to heart and continue to empathize and apply as we go through this U.S. history stuff to figure out more uh, on top of STEM advances and math advances and energy advances and things that attack the problems of the world, the interpersonal part is also important, um, as we talked about with both classes for third and fifth hour. Okay, uh, so that's what we're looking for for the assignment. Um, some kids got you know five points extra credit because of that. and. Yeah, I wasn't too much of a stickler on grammar or spelling, but please, you know, be a little bit better on that. Some kids turned in a scanned copy of like a handwritten thing. It's like, no, no, I want it typed. I want it typed. So any assignment we do, um, type it up, type it up. Uh, the test will be a little bit different because I'll give you the test. I'm okay if you like write it and then send a picture of it to me. That's fine too. But probably more digital is the way to go. Um, all right, so that's housekeeping for those issues. And uh, you know, help convey to those kids this is not being run through Canvas. We're running it through Google Classroom or at least Google Groups and YouTube videos, and uh, and also email, just through Google email. So that's how we're running it to be a little more connected, give you a little bit different spice, if you will. Uh, all right, so now we're going into part three of U.S. history, and under cotton is king. Uh, so we're going to transition. We, we've laid the groundwork here for our country in that we've had some social divides. Some with Native Americans, as we talked about last time, and American Indians, and those are some travesties. Uh, and now we're going to, and some of you covered this with Mr. Baldwin or, or Mr. Thorne's um, student teacher, but this lays the, paves the way for future years or future sections on Reconstruction, Civil Rights era, which is what we're going to get to. And I don't want to get to that part and people are like, well, I don't understand, like, if only people would just say, like, white is white, black is black, and we're fine. Um, that could be an oversimplification of matters. Not that we want to over, overly complicate it, but there is historically some unique things that the U.S. has that even, like, when Sweden criticizes the U.S. or in Britain criticizes the U.S., it's not necessarily a fair apples-to-apples -apples comparison in terms of what's happening. So I encourage you guys to pay attention to this section on you know cotton is king and slavery as we go more into the social issues of like the civil rights era jim crow laws stuff like that in fact we're going to talk a little bit about jim crow laws even post-slavery um, as well all right so under cotton is king there's three th main things you're going to write down in this section uh, the first is and a lot of you got to realize is people expeditiously want to make money here and so the question always comes about is what's the next avenue for money making um, you follow the money. That's U.S. history in a nutshell, a lot of ways. Uh, and it is cotton. So the first thing you're going to write down here is, by 1850, Britain's emerging textile industry, textile, T-E-X-T-I-L-E, demanded more and more cotton. 
Now, continent, there were other surrogates and substitutes used in terms of textile making. But it's sort of interesting and sad and cool, I guess, that a lot of what we'll see eventually in the Industrial Revolution, as well as in uh, the slavery model, is built off of textiles. Uh, the idea of making clothes that are somewhat tailored, we'll get to that Industrial Revolution, that are somewhat tailored and having generic sizes, small, you know, medium, large, extra large, those types of ideas. Um, prior to the Industrial Revolution did not exist. Did not exist. But the fact is it's this cool tangible idea of having more and more textiles, clothing made, that creates a middle class. Um, prior to this, is if you had tailored clothes, you were very much an elitist, one percenter if you will. And then there's everybody else that had like rags and stuff. Um, this idea created more of a middle class, and so the textile market in 1850, they needed cotton, 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 cotton. And so they created it in their factories, et cetera, a lot of this cotton. Other places did too, but you guys talked about that like triangular trade system and, and all that. We're not going to go into that. We've already covered that in other sections, or at least you did in previous um, sections in other classes. Uh, but it did. That's the first thing you're going to write down, more and more cotton. And so the West Indies, if you want to look at it, the Caribbean, uh, not just sugarcane fields, which were a big uh, reason why people had slaves, but for the U.S., because of our unique temperate regions in uh, southeastern continental U.S., my goodness, we can make cotton. We can make cotton. North Carolina, Virginia, we can make cotton. Yeah, tobacco was there too, but cotton was an underlying thing. And even tobacco, which was a nice pastime and stuff like that, it all paled in comparison, no pun intended, to the idea of having um, textiles, uh, mass-produced textiles and clothing for any and all, right? Because uh, that's more of a necessity, if you will, in terms of clothing as opposed to a fun pastime or even indigo. You know, we're like, ah, I'm farming indigo. Uh, I can have a deep blue in my china set. That paled in comparison to uh, cotton, 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 cotton. Um, okay, the second thing you're going to write down in this section is most Southern whites did not think of the institution of slavery as odd or weird, but rather, and for like 5,000 points, who can say it? Brooklyn? I have to keep imagining students in this classroom because it's weird not to. Uh, that's right, ding, 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 peculiar. They didn't see institution of slavery as odd or weird, but peculiar. That's how they saw slavery. Um, and so I do want to put that in quotes, peculiar, hint, hint, that could be on the test. So it's sad. Um, most Southerners, and just to get their idea on this, when you compare it to other countries, both with the triangular trade, where like they were servicing need, right? So you would have, in a weird way, like a lot of um, the ships would leave from Britain, if you will, to go to the west coast of Africa and deal in the slave trade get um, uh, slaves and then bring them to the West, whether to southeastern United States or to the Caribbean, West Indies for sugar cane, cotton, etc. And they get the raw materials and they send it back to Britain, which then can produce to the world um, and therefore earn money. All these uh, uh, fine produced, not gross, but more fine produced materials of textiles, etc. And then it, they have money to then have slaves and this is that triangular trade. Um, that's a uh, that's that trade system. But we weren't the only ones of developed democracies. There was a lot involved. Look at France, look at England. Uh, uh, Scandinavia didn't get involved too much because it's all their market. They weren't involved in that, not by necessarily choice, but they just weren't involved in making money that way. Um, they benefited from it. They benefited from clothes, etc. cetera. Um, but the population areas were like, clothes, 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 let's go. And so that's who was involved in it. Uh, and they actually were like ahead of the curve. It's a horrible way to look at it, but in terms of slavery, you had a lot of Western European countries who were especially in the Indies. Oh my gosh. And the mass deaths that happened because of like sugar cane uh, fires and all this stuff in the Caribbean. Ooh, that was super bad, super bad. But in those areas, uh, uh, they were at a couple decades because we were going through the independence area and our own issues in the War of 1812, that we eventually got into the game, so to speak, of slavery, but those individual countries were ahead of it. So they had already experienced it, and they were they're looking to, I guess you could say, pull out of it after a while. Um, but again, as you'll find out, post-1850, it wasn't necessarily because of this like 
great change of heart. There were things, amazing, inspirational, motivational ideas of people coming forth and saying, this needs to be abolished in these countries. Um, but a lot of it was the mechanization of industry. And so they started to have another way that's cheaper and more efficient to make textiles so slaves weren't used as much. So that that's where there was that disconnect. Um, and, and cotton gin wasn't yet available, all this stuff. So, so you started to see slaves being used more in the U.S. And we were catching up on a trend that was now going more and more out of style, if that makes sense in terms of context of Britain and France. Um, okay. So it is a peculiar thing because we looked at it in the southern part of the United States as like, well, it's sort of a weird prospect, but that's how it is. Almost if you want to make the analogy of like, having a husband or spouse who works in coal mines, it's like, it's a weird job. You know, you come home with a black lung or sit all over you, or, or if you work in a mechanic shop, you know, you have the perpetually like grimy hands. You know, ah, it's just a peculiar thing. Slavery was looked at in that same way. It's not inherently evil or anything like that. It's just sort of peculiar. That's that peculiar institution. Um, so um, that's what it meant. The third thing you're going to write down in this section is Southern chivalry. Uh, this does go into play as U.S. divides happen of different mindsets, Southern chivalry. Uh, the, and it's the idea that the white Southern elite could pose as being noble and proper in public, especially towards women. It's the idea that the white Southern elite could pose as being noble in public uh, and proper in public, especially towards women. The great thing about our country is there's so many geographic differences. We are one of the biggest geographic countries in the world, um, and we have you know, one of the biggest populations, and we're spread out in so many different ways. And um, in you compare it to India and China, uh, China does have a lot of different geographic regions, but the majority is va it's Han, it's H-A-N, it's that Han majority. Um, the U.S. we have because of, well, slavery and other issues, we, we've got a lot of diversity in our country. And because we kept going on with it post Britain and France, we do have more diversity because of that than those countries too, to this day. Um, and so that's a unique challenge we have and how do we get along in that way? But one of the positives about Southeastern United States is when it comes to chivalry, um, if you go there and some of you have spent time there, there is an expectation of sir and ma'am, right? That's very common. And, uh, and even if it's face value respect, even if behind their back they're just, they're killing you and they're, they're throwing slurs and angry expletives at you, that still happens. But at least face value, it's definitely more like proper. You'll see guys and girls, at least in my experience, who would never have social connections, but a guy would still open the door for a girl. Like it's more likely to happen there than in many other parts of the country because that chivalry idea still exists to this day there. Um, but there was this idea of like the ruling elite in terms of numbers, not a whole lot of them. And then you had the masses of slavery and that machinery of slavery down south, which made the south a little bit different because it was almost a throwback to times of nobility, even though our constitution specifically prohibits any title of nobility. Um, Supreme ex-chancellor, you know, whatever, or I knight thee, etc. We we want to get rid of titles of nobility, and we have, but Southern chivalry had that as well. Um, but that's a good thing from the South. I think there's there's some good things about that, uh, but that that also maybe re-solidified some of the disconnects between the upper you know elite and those who are lower. All right, now let's shift into slavery. In this section, there's a total. We're going to write down a lot because I'm trying to lead the way into Jim Crow laws, which those of you who, who maybe have had this in eighth grade or have heard in other classes, the idea of a codified system in the South where many individuals were deemed the judge, jury, and executioner for those who um, uh, were black, right? And where does it stem from? It stems from these slave codes. Uh, so there was a double standard. Those of you who had me in like World Civ, we talk about Nigeria, there's a double standard. Where in the south it's like a national code, but up north it's a code that's followed also by Sharia. There's like a, a double standard here. In the U.S. it's sort of flipped that there's like a national code of laws, but then there's also like a state code that goes way far in terms of prosecuting and what's due process and all that. So under slavery there's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven, all right? So seven total things we're going to write down. Um, the first is 
no black could own property, be out after dark, congregate with other slaves, carry a firearm, strike a white person, or marry. There were exceptions on this, but the rules for many of the southern states here, and federalism allowed for this because it did allow for experimentations on democracy and states could do different things. But it was they couldn't own property, they couldn't be out after dark, they couldn't congregate with other slaves, they couldn't carry a firearm, strike a white person, or marry. So if any of these stipulations were broken, it was grounds for them to like break it up and get violent. Uh, these are pretty draconian measures of, uh, of a small rule and then followed disproportionately with a lot of violence. Um, the second thing you're going to write down here is blacks could not testify in court against a white person. Um, blacks could not testify in court against a white person. And the, the stipulation between blacks and white, the weird thing about it is Caucasian is the general term for whites, but whites were also both Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon. So I want to sort of be, in a way, generic on that. But the idea of blacks, the, the concept of African Americans is awesome and it works. Uh, in the time of slavery, there's this weird stipulation that there's the Caribbean angle that was there who originated from those areas. Um, and uh, Hispaniola, like there's di different areas where the mixing of ethnicities, uh, whether it's going to be African American or black, you can use them synonymously here. Um, but just to be clear in terms of what we're talking about. Uh, okay. But yeah, black cannot testify against a white person in court. And so that meant. Oh, geez, if you have me for world civ, females in Sharia following countries really can't testify against men. It's again a similar code in that way uh, where blacks could not do that. And the third thing you're going to write down is uh, it was outlawed to teach a slave how to read or write. Outlawed uh, to teach a slave how to read or write. And for 5,000 points, Hunter Spackman. <laughs> uh, Ethan, help me out. Uh, why? Yeah, the nether sphere is correct. Because if you give individuals the ability to read and write, they're going to start to critically, critically think much more on their own. They're going to be more likely to uh, mobilize, unionize, organize. And nobody wants a critical thinker, right? And that's something we talked about in this class. Like We want to encourage that for that reason. So, so yes, not reading and writing. The fourth thing. Uh, if the slave owner killed a slave while punishing them, the slave owner was not guilty. It was permissible. If a slave owner killed a slave while punishing them, they were in the clear. So, so it gave the rules against a slave owner in terms of what they could do or not do is so liberal here in the sense it's so broad. They could kill somebody and who was a slave and say, oh, I was just uh, punishing him. Okay. That, that's it. That's all they had to do to justify it. Um, okay. The fifth thing is they lived in crude cottages. They lived in crude cottages near the master's house. These crude cottages, most of them did not have a uh, hardwood floor or slat floor. It was just a dirt floor. You know, it was four walls and a roof, but it was a crude cottage. And some students have said before, yeah, like cattle, uh, like property. And that's a, that's a hard thing. And, and I would never do this type of exercise, especially in a public school. But you could imagine, hypothetically, in a class, I mean, some have done it in the 60s and 70s to help students understand this, but it's like super controversial. When you start to designate a certain class based on something you can visualize as, wearing glasses or having hair, it's a little harder in terms of sexual orientation because you can't, visualize that. Um, usually you, you can't do that. So when you see somebody based on a visual indicator and you marginalize them in a group, it's amazing how they start to have a self-fulfilling prophecy that I am bad, I am dumb, I am worthless, regardless of any background. You could, you could go into an like next year, I hope I have a ton of you in my AP comparative government class. You know, I think I've been so impressed in the short time we've been together for these third and fifth hour classes. I've, I really miss you guys. I'm not going to get emotional. I really miss you guys. Um, 
coming off debate, it's always a big season and a hard season. Um, and I wouldn't have had our debate season end anywhere else than that fifth hour class because you guys had some empathy and understood. Uh, but even if I were to take you guys who are in my AP class or you guys right now and say anybody who has like brown hair, uh, you're going to sit in the back and you have to turn around and face the wall because you're not worthy of actual discussion and lecture. Uh, nobody can talk to you. They have to only send a note to you. And um, I, as a teacher, will never talk to you. That type of social experiment will forever scar you. I mean, think about you guys as individuals. When somebody has said even something remote, it's not even true about you, physical appearance or whatever, how that sticks with you. It sticks with you for your whole life. You compound that with generation after generation, about two generations at least, if not three, of people who were codified in slavery as being subhuman. I don't care how capable you are. I could take the smartest kids in the class and relegate that to them, and they're going to create a self-fulfilling prophecy that it just continues to go on. So even if like next year we see them, it's like, hey, person that we totally vilified in class, yeah, just turn in the assignment, yeah, just talk to the teacher. That's probably not going to happen because they've already started to have a pattern or routine in their mind, like, I'm not, mm -mm, I can't do that. And so when people in the future were to give them a hard time, like, hey, brown-haired kid, why don't you talk to the teacher? Why don't you advocate for yourself? Why don't you turn that assignment in on time? They're going to say, well, I, I, I'm not allowed. What do you mean you're not allowed? You just, just do it. It's so much easier said than done when generation after generation has happened. And, and there's that. Um, forget base intelligence. Slave owners in the South start to justify this in saying, well, they're a sub-race. We can look into the Bible and the curse of Cain and how these guys are facing vilification rightfully so. And you can make those statements. Uh, but they're sort of the chicken and the egg statement. Like, you might think that they already deserve this to begin with, which is really messed up. But even if they didn't deserve this, they're going to continue on a bad pattern of mediocrity at best because they've been told they can only be mediocre. And maybe there, there weren't tons of Einsteins, but maybe there were. But we just relegated them to be nothing. And so that, that is a hard thing to root out of people, right? No matter where you fall on the spectrum, that's a hard thing to root out of people. Okay. So... Uh, the sixth thing you're going to write down is they worked six days a week, 18 hours a day. Um, they worked 16 days a week, 18 hours a day. And I've mentioned this to some of the World Civ kids I've had before, but when I was in Southeast Asia, I had a really interesting conversation with a guy who lived during the communist reign, where this is what they were doing, 18-hour days. They were basically slaves on agrarian farms and stuff. Uh, they were getting one meal a day. And he was saying, I wish I could go back to those times. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You wish you'd go back to those times. And he said, because they thought for you, they provided for you, and they tried to make sure you didn't die, and I didn't have to think for myself. Wow. When individuals are in that mode and mindset, it's very difficult genetically, it's very difficult generationally to say, just snap out of it. We're all Americans. Come on. That is... That's hard. And, and to put it in perspective, in Cambodia, it lasted, this communist reign, three years, three years, three months, where a quarter of their population was killed off. Those who rose up, those who were intelligent, et cetera, were killed off. Um, that didn't exactly happen in three years, but we had decades of this slavery institution and what that dealt, right? I mean, that's some real baggage to carry with it. Okay, the last thing, the seventh thing, and I want to take a little bit of time on this one. You're going to write down is, of all developed democracies, America was the last to abolish slavery. Of all developed democracies, America was the last to abolish slavery. Now, what's that metric? Someone say, well, no, there's there was slavery that existed post, you know, 20th century or in the 20th century uh, in parts of Africa or, uh, heck, the caste system in India. I, I'm not here to say you're wrong. You're, you're not wrong. Those are not developed democracies. The reason I say this stat is important is to this day in the United Nations, in EU, UN, stuff, whatever, 
when Scandinavia looks down on its nose at the U.S., when Britain looks down on its nose, when they abolished slavery decades before we did, it's easy for them to make that judgment against us because we do have that cross to bear. Like, we, we have made that mistake and we, we lingered in that. Some could say it was based on the well, Ben Franklin's statement, those who sacrifice essential liberty for temporary security deserve neither. Now, it's sort of flipped here because did our country want the security of having some goods and products made efficiently with slaves and we gave up liberty to ensure that? Like, maybe we don't deserve that. But Ben Franklin also gets to the point that like federalism in our country, it's going to be messy. It's not gonna, you're not gonna make a change happen because we want people to be bought in from the bottom up and not the top down. Uh, and slavery was a big consequence of that. We'll get to in the next section, but Abraham Lincoln always talked about a new birth of freedom. That's a constitutionally profound line in the Gettysburg Address. A new birth of freedom. It really lingers uh, because it talks about the flaws of our Constitution and our Declaration where like we were being hypocrites and now it's a chance to actually like live up to it. We've all been in a time in our life where we, t heck as a debate coach I've seen this, um, where I've got the kid who's a heart of gold. You know, he wants or she wants to totally do what's right. But then life gets in the way. Uh, you get busy with other things. You don't. You're not as disciplined at home. You, you get tired. You take too many naps. Uh, your dating life's too busy, and you don't get the discipline and regiment on a daily schedule, weekly schedule, to actually do the things you want to do. I know they want to do it. The United States wanted to have equality, and all men are created equal, and all that stuff. But we still had problems, and so the Civil War was a chance to have a new birth of freedom. But that also means that we were behind the curve and we carry that guilt that stigma if you wonder why other countries are like oh yeah the u.s <laughs> all those issues with slavery yeah it also made that meant that we have a lot more diversity so that's a silver lining and we've had to figure things out um you know but that's hey, real teachers, still chicken noodle soup she's going to be here till about 12 15. 12 15 you guys need to go get that chicken noodle soup it'll be on um <laughs> by the time this uploads so that's something to keep in mind. Um, heck, I mean, there's certain analogies where it's actually most ethnicists and social scientists would agree that it's easier to be uh, Muslim in the U.S. than it is to be in England. You're like, what? Why? Because they're not used to having diversity in England. Heck, look at Cache Valley. There's a challenge at times when there's something new, refugee, whatever that comes in. We just don't, a lot of individuals don't know any better because they're, they're raised in a very homogeneous area. And so they're not trying to be mean, but it just makes it a little harder because they're not used to differences. You go to any major city in the U.S., and they're used to every difference. So anything that's different or weird, they're like, well, all right, sounds good. Um, so that's one silver lining of having you know, slavery and having a big proportion of our you know, 10 to 12 percent of our population is African American. Um, and that's, a, that's nice because we do have some diversity. But we do have that cross and that we abolished slavery after many of the developed democracies, France and, and England, etc. Okay, um, Netherlands and stuff like that. So, so this is our part three of A House Divided. We're going to finish up part four on Wednesday. And then what we'll do is we're going to do like the review game. Uh, most likely I'm going <laughs> to... I can't interact, but I'm going to do a review module on Friday. That's the plan. And that way, like, whether we're back in school next week or not, which I think you all are aware, probably not. I, I will knock on wood. We'll see what happens for the end of the school year. But I think dig in, dig in for a while. Um, but I'll give that module on Friday. You'll be ready for the test that I will distribute on Tuesday. And like I mentioned before, I'm going to give it to you. If you're in class, yes, of course, in class. But I'm probably going to give it where it's like via email, like here's the attachment, here it is, boom. And you have by the end of the day on Tuesday next week to give it back to me, right? And it's on your honor. You're not going to use notes or outside sources. And uh, that's the plan. So have a good day. Uh, I hope things are going well and hope your families are uh, healthy, wealthy, and wise. See ya.